So welcome back. So let's uh, we will we will start the the last session of the day. It's going to be multi sector models and inflation after uh, COVID nineteen. So the 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 setup is is the same as before. Uh, it's Sebastian Heise is going to uh, uh, present the first paper. Uh, the paper is about import competition and labor market uh, in the U.S. Uh, the the floor is is yours. You will have twenty five minutes. Thanks. Okay, um, thanks very much uh, for putting this paper on the program. This is joint work with Mary Amiti, Fatih Karahan, and Aishibu Shahin, and I work for the Fed, so the usual disclaimer applies. Um, inflation has recently surged in many countries around the world. In the US, it peaked at 8.9% in June of 2022, the highest reading since November 1981. And this behavior of inflation in the current expansion has been very different from inflation behavior in other more recent expansions, as the following couple of diagrams try to make clear. So here what we are plotting is um, the growth of core CPI over the course of an expansion. Well, on the x-axis, we have the number of quarters passed since unemployment peaked in the preceding recession. So what this line here is showing is that in the uh, 1970s expansion, core CPI grew by about 17% or so after 10 quarters. And then in the following expansions, prices grew slower and slower. So here the 80s expansion, the 90s expansion, early 2000s expansion, and finally the expansion starting in 2009, where core CPI had grown by just about 5% after 10 quarters. The current expansion is very different in that price growth has been much more rapid and has been tracking more like the 80s expansion than any of the more recent expansions. This strong price growth was led in particular by the goods sector. So here we're showing the same diagram, um, just split into core goods and core services. And you can see on the left side that the growth of uh, core goods prices surpassed even the growth in the 1970s expansion um, and has only recently started to moderate, where services price growth initially um, was relatively weak and only recently accelerated. So what has contributed uh, to this particular behavior of inflation? Well, first, as we've talked about a lot today, there have been supply chain disruptions, and they have led to the surge of the prices of imported inputs. Second, uh, there's been a decline in the willingness to work in the US, so the reservation wage has actually risen by about 20%. And as a result of these developments, we've seen simultaneous growth in input prices and in wages. So in this table, I'm showing you um, annualized growth rates of different variables uh, in the last four expansions. So in the first row, we see that import prices have been growing at an annualized rate of about 6% in the current expansion. And if we focus on import prices of so-called industrial supplies, these are inputs into the production process, such as rubber, metals, chemicals, and so on. These have been growing at an annualized rate of 20% in the current expansion. In the third row, we see that wages have also grown rapidly. So wage growth has uh, come at about 4 to 5%, about 1 to 2 percentage points faster than in previous expansion. So in addition to this kind of uh, simultaneous growth of wages and input prices, there's been a shift in the good share in, uh, in consumer expenditures. So the share uh, that's going to goods has risen from 36% to 38%. And finally, as we all know, the monetary policy in the US has been very accommodative throughout 2021, as this was already playing out, and only started to raise interest rates um, in 2022. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of work on the current inflation episode. Some of it uh, was presented uh, here earlier today by Benigno and Egertsen. What we bring to the table here is that we examine the surge in inflation through the lens of a two-sector New Keynesian model. Um, we're going to focus on particular on 2021, though the lessons we draw are more broadly applicable. And we do four key things. So first, we uh, examine the impact of the combined shocks, so the wage pressures, uh, supply chain bottlenecks, uh, shift in consumer expenditures, monetary policy. And we show that this combined shock generates about four percentage points of inflation, accounting for the entire pickup of core CPI that we saw uh, in the U.S. in 2021. Second, we examine the role of the different shocks, and we find, quite intriguingly, that the interaction of import price and labor supply shocks amplifies the individual effect of the shocks by about 0.7 percentage points relative to a world in which these shocks happen separately. 
In addition, the shift of consumption towards goods added another percentage point to inflation and included some additional amplification. Third, we turn to the role of monetary policy and we show that controlling inflation would have required a very aggressive monetary policy at the expense of a deep recession. And then finally, we present some regression evidence using aggregate and industry level data and we, we show that this evidence is actually consistent with this amplification channel uh, that we emphasize here under point two. Okay, so let me go and just describe a little bit the model that we have. Um, given the time, this is going to be relatively high level. So the model we have is the standard New Keynesian DSGE model with wage and price rigidity with kind of four key departures from the plain vanilla textbook model. So first there are two sectors, goods and services. And these sectors differ in their labor share and in their consumption share. And moreover, um, there's competition, but only in the goods sector, foreign firms compete in the output market. Whereas in the services sector, we assume that all firms are domestic firms. Second, there are two inputs to production, labor and intermediate inputs. And these intermediates in turn can be either domestically produced or imported. And this production structure gives rise to rich substitution patterns. <clears throat> so when the price of imported intermediates goes up, firms substitute towards domestically produced intermediates and towards domestic labor. And this can have implications for wage inflation um, and domestic production. Third, there's a finite number of domestic and foreign producers. So this gives rise to strategic interactions and incomplete pass through. So when foreign competitors cause rise and they increase their prices, this allows domestic firms to expand their markups without losing market share to their foreign competitors. And finally, we allow for changes in the expenditure share on goods to be um, to match the data. So we calibrate this model using standard parameters uh, from the literature. I just want to talk about three key parameters in this model. The first is the elasticity of substitution between labor and intermediates. And we set this elasticity to two in the goods sector or the manufacturing sector and to 1.5 in services based on some work by Chan in disaggregated Danish data. But in the paper, we actually explore what happens if labor and intermediates are combined in a Leontief production function, kind of thinking about the very short term where you can't substitute between labor and intermediates. And we show that the findings are actually surprisingly similar uh, in that scenario. Second, um, the elasticity of substitution between domestic and foreign intermediates, which we set to two, based on some work by Feenstra that has estimated this uh, elasticity to be in the range between one and four. And finally, we're going to assume a very persistent monetary policy rule to match that the Fed didn't really respond initially to these shocks, and we're going to set this persistence parameter to 0.97. It's just a, um, a persistence term in the Taylor rule. So we're going to solve this model uh, in Dynair using a second order approximation. So there'll be nonlinear effects uh, that we capture in this model. So let me first throw all the shocks into this model and show you that we match kind of the pickup in core CPI. And then I'll take a step back and inspect the mechanism by looking at individual shocks and how they contribute. So first let's combine all the shocks. So there are three shocks to capture labor supply and supply chain disruptions. First, an asymmetric shock to the disutility of labor, which is stronger in services than in goods to capture kind of the experience during the pandemic where services were harder hit. And we calibrate the shock to match the fact that uh, there was a 0.5 percentage point decline in labor supply as documented by one of my co-authors. Second, there's an imported input price shock of 20% to match the observed rise in imported input prices. And finally, a foreign competition shock, which is a marginal cost shock of 8.1% to foreign competitors' marginal cost. And we match, we generate this uh, because foreign firms didn't actually gain any market share in the US during this period. So the import to GDP ratio was actually surprisingly constant throughout this period. And so foreign firms must have experienced roughly a similar shock as, as US firms. In addition to these three shocks, there's this consumption shift. So we, we generate a, a shift on, uh, in, in the utility function to generate a shift in the expenditure share towards goods uh, from 35% to 37%. And finally, there's an accommodative monetary policy shock to keep the normal interest rate uh, zero on impact to kind of match that the Fed didn't, didn't raise interest rates. Okay, so what happens when we put all of these into the model? So here I'm just plotting some impulse responses. Here, just the shocks. Um, so we see on the, in the left panel, the labor disutility shock, which is stronger in services than in goods. Uh, 
On the right, we see that imported input prices go up by 20%, and we see this increase in um, foreign firms' marginal costs. Um, and then we have this two percentage point increase in the expenditure share on goods, and this is our kind of normal interest rate pass, so it's zero on impact, and then it's very, very sluggish. It, it only goes up by about 1% uh, in, in, this, in this model. Okay, so what do we learn? Um, so what happens in this model when we feed all of these five shocks into the model simultaneously is that there's a strong increase in domestic input demand and in domestic labor demand. And this is because faced with this strong increase in imported input prices, which we think of as supply chain bottlenecks, supply pressures, firms substitute towards making stuff domestically using domestic labor, and this drives up domestic labor demand and domestic input demand. The effect is much stronger in goods than in services because, de because demand shifts towards goods. And so it's precisely in the goods sector where this additional demand comes in. And so um, it, it increases labor and domestic input demand much more strongly there. As a result of these shocks and this disutility shock to labor, there's an increase in the real wage in both sectors, which drives up real marginal costs, uh, in particular in the goods sector as well. And so as a result of this, we see significant wage inflation and consumer price inflation, which is about 4%, which kind of matches the core inflation pickup that we saw um, in 2021. So now that we've done all these shocks simultaneously, let's go and just look at them individually to see what we can actually learn uh, from this model. So we're going to consider these shocks one by one. We're going to recalibrate this monetary policy shock so that nothing like the interest rate pass kind of looks the same. So there's no difference in monetary policy across these. So the first thing we learn is a substitution effect. So the imported input price shock on its own can actually generate substantial wage and price inflation. That's what we do here. So here we just feed in this imported input price shock into the model, nothing else. And we see that this shock actually generates about 0.5% uh, price inflation. So the intuition is that when these supply chain bottlenecks happen, imported input prices go up, firms substitute towards making stuff domestically in the US, and this drives up demand for domestic production factors and puts pressure onto wages. Without any additional shocks to the labor market, you already get 0.5% uh, price inflation. The second lesson is that a shock to foreign competitors also raises inflation in the US. So here we just feed in this marginal core shock to foreign competitors, generates about 1% price inflation. The intuition here is that when foreign competitors are getting hit with a shock, consumers substitute or switch towards domestic producers. They buy more from domestic firms. This again causes these firms to demand more domestic inputs and drives up wages and so on. In addition, domestic firms now have greater pricing power. They can actually increase their markups because their foreign competitors have just had to increase their prices, and so they'll take advantage of that. And so that generates about 1% inflation. And then finally, and most importantly, there's an amplification effect. So this joint supply shock, this joint effect on the labor market and on import prices has an amplified effect on inflation. So to illustrate this, let me just show you the third of these individual shocks, this labor disutility shock. That's the blue dotted line here. And now let me just feed all three shocks into the model separately and just add up these lines. So that's just this red dash line. I'm just adding up the gray, blue, and green line. Now what happens if I put these shocks into the model jointly? Well, what happens is that we find significant amplification. So wage inflation increases by one percentage point more and price inflation increases by 0.7 percentage points more. And the intuition here is that in normal times, say in normal times, there's some pressure on the labor market. In normal times, firms can then substitute away, say from using domestic labor towards using Chinese labor, importing, imp importing products directly from China, thus blunting the effect of this cost increase on their prices. So they can kind of play around with their inputs to reduce the cost pressures that they're facing. But in this environment, where both import prices and wages are going up simultaneously, they can't substitute between these factors of production. So they have to take these cost pressures and therefore increase their prices by more. In addition to these shocks on the cost side, there was this shift in expenditures towards the goods sector. So how does that contribute? So first, let me just put the shock separately into the model by itself. It raises inflation by about 0.5 percentage points. This is because when we feed the shock into the model, there's a shift towards the goods sector and the two sectors are not symmetric. Uh, good sector uses less labor than services, 
And so on net, there's actually some, infl some wage inflation and some price inflation that we generate from this. Now, the blue line is just the joint supply shocks that I just showed you before, which was th about 3% inflation. And then the red dash is, again, just adding up this consumption shift and the joint supply shocks. What happens when we feed in these shocks again uh, together, the consumption shift and the joint supply shocks, we get some additional amplification, about 0.4% uh, extra price inflation. And this is because this expenditure uh, shift shifts precisely towards the sector that is experiencing the strong supply chain pressure, strong wage pressures, and so on. So you're, you're shifting consumption towards the sector that is already under pressure, and that generates some additional inflation, uh, as we see here. And so in total, we get about 4% inflation. Okay, <clears throat> so what could monetary policy have done? So the Fed was very accommodative uh, in 2021. So we're going to run an experiment. We're going to ask, well, what if the Fed had been more aggressive? Okay. So we're going to compare our baseline policy with this very persistent Taylor rule and accommodative monetary policy shock to two alternatives. One is standard Taylor rule, which is not as persistent, which we calibrate based on literature with persistent of 0.8. And second, an aggressive policy where we put even lower persistence and a much more aggressive response to inflation. And we ask, what are the implications for output labor demand and inflation uh, under these alternative scenarios? So here are some variables that we look at, the so normal interest rate, average wage inflation, averaged across the two sectors, and price inflation. So the left panel just shows basically how these policies look like. So the black line is what I showed you before is the baseline. The red is the standard Taylor rule. It increases a little bit more. And the blue is a really aggressive policy. Basically, uh, the Fed raises interest rate by 7% on impact. Um, Interestingly, what happens is that there's not that much of a, of a dent to wage inflation and price inflation when we do the standard Taylor rule. So these are actually still relatively high. You really need this aggressive monetary policy to really make a difference. And the reason for this is that most of this inflation is driven by supply side shocks. And so there's only that much that monetary policy can do really to, to bring down inflation. However, this aggressive policy comes at a cost. It, it generates a deep recession, as we see here. So the blue line, both gross output and consumption uh, go down significantly. However, if, if you want to think of labor demand as kind of the flip side of unemployment, we actually still see strong labor demand. And the reason for this is, again, that in response to this kind of foreign shocks, this, this supply chain shock, there's a shift towards making stuff in the US towards domestic production and that props up the domestic labor market. So actually, with our baseline policy, labor demand goes up by 12%. And even with the aggressive policy, there's still a kind of a, a tight labor market because more stuff is getting made in the US. And this kind of matches what we, what we see in the data to some extent, that the labor market is very tight. OK, so in the last couple of minutes, let me try and provide some empirical evidence, for, in particular for this amplification channel that I've been talking about. So our model generates uh, increasing marginal costs, so input price and wages, and some amplification. So can we see this in the data? So I'm going to do two exercises. First, I'm going to look at some aggregate data. I'm going to run some local projections um, to trace out IRFs with aggregate variables. And second, I'm going to turn to industry-level data to run panel regressions for about 500 six-digit uh, NAICS industries. So first, let's go to the aggregate analysis. Um, so here. On the left-hand side, um, I'm going to regress uh, inflation. I'm going to use the PPI. I'm going to have uh, finished goods producer price inflation in some quarter T plus H. And I'm going to regress this on input price inflation in orange and wage inflation in green to see how changes in wage inflation or input price inflation are correlated or pass through into uh, producer price inflation H quarters down the line. And we're going to have some lags just to capture any, any um, persistent dynamics. So we're going to estimate this, this regression um, kind of for age running from zero to 20 quarters, so up to 20 quarters ahead uh, for the period from 1988 to 2022. And for both input price and wage inflation, I'm going to find the age with the highest correlation. So basically, we're going to, we're going to get kind of nice hum-shaped uh, impulse responses. I want to find the gamma age and the beta age with the highest correlation. And I'm going to see how that kind of peak pass-through varies over time. So I'm going to take that, I'm going to estimate this regression with 25 year rolling window, and I'm going to look how this gamma age at the peak age, which happens to be at five quarters, 
And this beta age, which which it's is at uh, at its peak at nine quarters, how those have evolved over time. So what do we see? Well, we see that this correlation, this pass through, has come down over time. In particular, wage to price pass through was basically zero throughout the two thousands. And I have another paper with my co-authors where we have kind of argued that this was because of import competition from China that there was basically zero wage to price pass through. But importantly, in the recent period, there has been a jump up in this pass through from input prices and wages into producer prices. There's been kind of a reemergence of wage to price pass through. And that is consistent with the story I've been trying to tell in the current period where firms are facing both input price pressures and wage pressures. They are forced to pass through these wage pressures into producer prices because they, they can't substitute and the Chinese competitors are also experiencing a similar shock. Now we can actually test this more directly. We can actually just throw in this interaction term into this regression uh, directly and trace out this, this row age. So let me just run this regression from age uh, zero to age equals 20 and see how that impulse response looks like. And indeed we find a positive and significant impulse response for this row. So indeed inflation is higher when both input prices and wages go up at the same time. Normally, this is just aggregate data. So a lot can be there in aggregate data. Maybe expectations are changing and so on. So the last thing I want to do is I want to do some industry analysis. Um, so I'm going to use my 506 digit uh, NAICS industries and I'm going to run a kind of a similar uh, regression. So I'm going to have on the left hand side uh, four quarter changes of the producer price index. Um, and on the right hand side, I'm going to have four quarter changes in input prices, uh, which we construct using domestic, domestic and imported input prices using the IO matrix. We're going to have um, wages and we also now can, can control for competitors prices, foreign competitors prices, which are important. So, for example, the competitors in the car industry would just be the price of imported cars. So we can just get these import prices from the data. And then importantly, we can control for changes in productivity. And we have industry fixed effects and time fixed effects, which soak up any aggregate changes in expectations and so on. So let me just estimate this regression for the good sector, uh, where it's kind of the most, uh, the results are the strongest, the results for the services sector are in the paper. So we estimate this regression um, using both these terms and levels, plus additional interactions for 2021 to see if things have changed in 21. And so here's what we find. So we find that in the pre-2021 period, the pass-through from input prices into producer prices was about 24%. But in, the, in 2021, this pass-through increased from about 24% to the sum of these two, it increased to about 40%. There was, again, this pickup of pass-through from input prices to producer prices. Firms are passing through more of the input price shocks as they are forced to do because they can't really substitute based on our kind of model story. For wages, we saw zero pass through in the pre 2021 period, and then a jump up to 13% wage to price pass through. And finally, the, the correlation of domestic producer price changes and, and foreign competitors uh, price changes has also increased kind of consistent with all firms experiencing similar shocks and US firms taking advantage of the fact that their foreign competitors are raising their prices to also raise their prices in turn. What happens if we put in this interaction term into this regression? we find a, a positive and significant uh, interaction term kind of saying that the inf inflation effect is large when both wages and prices go up together. And importantly, once we put in this interaction term, there's no in additional effect from 2021. So this entire pickup in pass through is explained by this interaction between input prices and wages. Okay, so let me conclude here with the kind of key takeaways from this talk. Um, so we can interpret these supply chain disruptions that we've seen as a partial reversal, partial reversal of the disinflationary effects of globalization that we have enjoyed over the last two decades. And so even though some of these supply chain disruptions are going away in the current period, you can think of um, changes in trade patterns as countries are strategically thinking about sourcing from China and so on as potentially having similar effects and, and keeping inflation a little bit higher than than we were used to during this decade where, where really there was a lot of um, uh, sourcing from abroad and taking advantage of competition from China. Second, we find that part of the tightening of the labor market is due to supply chain disruptions on their own as firms have substituted towards domestic uh, production. Third, this joint import price and wage shock has amplified uh, the inflation impact 
and the consumption shift has further increased inflation. And finally, kind of uh, being kind of positive about the Fed's role in monetary policy would have needed to be very aggressive to reduce inflation in this model uh, because of the key role that was played by supply side shocks um, in our framework. Thanks very much uh, for listening. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. The discussant is uh, Katja Paneva from the Federal Reserve Board. You have 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the organizers. It's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, it was a pleasure to read the paper. And um, I just really want to emphasize the usual disclaimer that my views are my own. They don't represent uh, any of the views of my colleague at the Federal Reserve Board. And my comments are generally going to be, you know, if I, if I was a better rounded economist, maybe the comments would be different, but my comments would be from the perspective of somebody who's really spent the last three years looking through every theory and explanation of uh, what we've seen uh, over the last few years. Uh, I've been doing this for more than three years, but the last few years were particularly exciting. Um, so just a brief recap, no equations, what, 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 what is the motivation for this paper is to um, construct a two-sector New Keynesian DSGE model with multiple factors of production, foreign competition, only in the goods sector, and endogenous markups. And the model is used to evaluate the effectiveness of monetary policy in two scenarios. In the first scenario, the recently high inflation is driven by supply chain disruptions and uh, labor market disruptions. And in the second scenario, inflation is demand driven mainly because of the switch from services consumption to goods consumption during the pandemic. The main findings, at least my big takeaways uh, from the paper, were that the combination of supply chain uh, disruptions and labor market disruption, disruptions pushes inflation more than the two shocks would individually push it, uh, than the combined effect of the two shocks separately. Why? Because the firms cannot easily substitute when the price of intermediate materials uh, goes up. In order to lower costs, they would use more labor, but labor is also more expensive because uh, uh, because this utility in the labor market increased. And uh, also, the, the supply chain disruptions affect foreign competition and their prices as well, which allows the domestic companies to, to pass through the higher costs to consumer prices. So the model can also be calibrated to produce the same increase in inflation just using a demand shock to goods. So you can get the same outcome for inflation, but via different channels. And depending on what the different channel is, the paper says, if the increase in reflection in inflation reflects supply, uh, supply chain disruptions and labor market disruptions, less aggressive monetary policy is better. Otherwise, you hurt the labor market too much. If the increase in inflation is demand driven, you need to act faster and raise rates early in order to, re to, to avoid raising rates even more and causing a recession later on. So that's a brief recap, uh, very intuitively. Uh, I, did, I like the paper a lot. I like pay. You know, I'm particularly partial to papers that look at different sectors, and 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 I've my dissertation many many years ago was on the goods and services sectors, but here I, I wanted to show a chart which many of you have seen many times, which illustrates well why one model might not explain well what happened during the pandemic. Um, and I'm only focusing on core inflation because I think energy did its own thing and, and it's very hard to come up with a macro DSG model that can explain well what happened to energy and core inflation or might attribute more 
let's say, to supply chain disruptions only because energy went up. So again, this is only focusing on, on core, and I've split it into core goods, housing services, and core services, excluding housing. And you can see how different the behavior of the red, uh, the red line, which was inflation in core goods, how different in terms of timing and magnitude was than what happened in services. And I'm excluding housing. It went up much earlier and it, w I mean, it went up a little bit earlier and it went up by a lot more than services. It also has come down, which we have not yet seen it in services. So the, there are some differences in both the magnitude and um, and the timing. And that's why I think uh, looking at the paper that looks at goods and services sector separately is very helpful. The model is realistic. And first I had, but complicated. I mean, it's realistic and complicated. Uh, you can't have, you know, um, you know, a realistic model without it being complicated. Um, the amplified inflation effect from the from the combination of simultaneous shocks is very plausible and relevant. However, some of the assumptions and the shocks are a little bit harder to understand. And and I'll just start with with the big picture, which applies to this paper, but I think several of the presentations today was that in reality what happened during the pandemic was a combination of supply and demand shocks. And it's very hard to disentangle and for simplicity we label it differently in the papers, but they are not but they are not independent. Um, so in this model, uh, oh, okay, so the title of the slide is what is a supply chain disruption? And in this model, it's an exogenous increase in the prices of imported inputs. And in several of the presentations today, I, I, I kind of heard people maybe um, using in, in the same way supply chain disruption as a supply shock, but they are not the same thing. And so my colleagues and I have struggled a lot with it. And we started throwing terms like bottlenecks and shortages and supply chains. And we, we made this simple supply demand econ 101 diagram to, to think about it through this, uh, through this a little bit, just for, for us to clarify it. And I still find it very helpful. So let's say you start with S0 and D0 and you're at the equilibrium point A. If, if there is a demand shock, you get to the steeper part of the supply curve. And right there, you start seeing pressures on the supply chains because you've hit a very vertical, like very steep part of the supply curve. You can also get a supply shock, right? A supply shock would be the move from S0 to S1, and you get at B. And so my point of this slide is that, you know, in this paper, it's kind of like import inputs increased, you know, for their own exogenous reason. <laughs> but, but in reality, they did increase because demand for goods increased and, and there were supply shocks at the same time. Factories closing, uh, microchips missing, right? It's, it, it was a combination of that. So it, it just, that, that's what I struggle with, with, you know, some of the papers and, uh, is, uh, you know, if we label them supply and demand and we make recommendations for monetary policies to go back and ask, well, was the increase in importing inputs really a supply shock? Or was it also driven by increased demand because of accommodative monetary policy in the US, for example? Okay, and then if 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 we are gonna stay take stand there, what 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 would be the implications for monetary policy be? My other struggle reading the paper was the substitution effect. So when I read these papers, I always can try to come up with examples in my head, then uh, then so I understand what's going on, and 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 just to make sure it makes sense, right? So. Um, in the paper, an increase in import in the price of imported inputs leads to an increase for domestic inputs. I totally can see this, right? It, it happens, and which then 
in, in turn leads to increase in demand for domestic labor because now the inputs will be produced domestically and labor will be needed. Right? As long as there are substitutes, I can see the I can see it there. Uh, there are plenty of imported inputs that have no substitution, so uh, we won't see it there. The, the part that I struggled with a little bit more was that firms also can substitute away from intermediate inputs towards labor. And I get it, right? These are our models. But I was thinking, well, if you make furniture uh, and you need a specific input, like there's only that much you can do. Wow. Okay. To to um, to replace uh, uh, inputs with labor, and I think Sebastian said, you know, a Leontief function. I didn't see it in the paper, but if if such a function produces the same results, I will totally go with it because again, it was a struggle for me. I'll I'll skip the next step. I think because because of this uh, uh, the substitution uh, towards. Uh, labor which particularly hits the the good sector um the left panel are the the responses of real wages in the in the good sector which is the black line and the red one and it doesn't matter whether i take this panel from figure six seven or ten it doesn't matter what the shock is in in the paper it's always uh wages in the good sector that increase by more but in reality, what happened, if you look at on the right in, in the ECI measures in the US, it was wages in services that increased more during um, uh, after during and after COVID. So um, so that's that's something to, to think about um, when matching to data. And my last point, because I don't have time for more, would be the assumption, one of the assumptions in the paper is that uh, uh, wages and prices are equally sluggish because because of the rapid adjustment of wages in the recent period. I just wanted to, uh, it was a Fed's note posted maybe two days ago, so like, there's no way, you know, the authors could have known this, but, you know, the, the frequency of price changes also increased markedly during the pandemic. So, you know, if this if this is an important assumption for the results, that uh, prices are equally sticky during the pandemic and before and in prices and in wages it's something um, for the authors to look at um, so that's it very nice paper i enjoyed reading it it made me think about channels and interactions that are often using from the micro models um, and and the globalization in general so thank you Thank you, Katja. And uh, then let's uh, collect some questions from the audience. I see John there. Hello. Uh, Joe Hazel from the London School of Economics. Uh, thanks for a great, really interesting paper. Uh, one question I had is I was, I was quite surprised that uh, as I read it by itself, the shift in consumption from services to goods didn't seem to have a big impact on inflation per se even though this is very very big only in interaction with the other shocks and i was trying to think through why this isn't and hopefully you can tell me in a second i guess it's something to do with the fact that to a first order um, inflation is going to rise in one sector and fall by the other as there's a as a consumption shift across sectors so if that is right i was wondering if that's if that's realistic um, you know, one can imagine mechanisms where, for instance, wages rise in the goods sector, but they don't fall in the services sector. So, per se, the shift from goods to services, sorry, from services to goods does have big inflationary effects, which are sort of missing in your model. Um, so, I guess in general, I'd be curious if you could comment more about why that very large effect, very large shift, sorry, doesn't have, have big effects in inflation except when interacted with other things. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for the good discussion and for an and extra question. Um, so let me try and respond. So we have a slightly newer version of the paper, which I'm sorry I didn't send you. So, um, 
we I, I guess we're trying to tone down a little bit the supply versus demand shock so as, as you picked up and as, as others have picked up um, it's very hard to try and separate the demand and supply shock so we, we want to get away a little bit from that so I, I guess we're just trying to consider a couple of shocks that we've seen import prices have gone up we feed this into the model but we don't necessarily want to take a stand on what fraction of this is due to demand versus supply we're just looking at them, but we're not trying to attribute anything to demand versus supply. Um, on the substitution uh, channel, so um, so I guess from your example, I, um, I guess because this is an aggregate model, I'm not thinking about a firm that is making furniture and buying wood from China, then suddenly using its own labor to go out and chopping wood. I guess I'm thinking there in, in, in reality, there are like two firms, there's like a domestic firm that is producing wood and a domestic furniture maker and instead of using a, a a chinese wood manufacturer this firm is now using the domestic supplier so it is using domestic labor but it's not within the same firm there's like two firms but they get aggregated together in the in the model that's how i'm thinking about it um, we do have a leontief version where basically labor and um, intermediates are complements and we still find a, a very significant inflation effect. The reason is as long as there's substitution from foreign intermediates towards domestic intermediates, so you're, you're substituting those, then because labor and domestic intermediates are complements, if you're, if you're using more domestic intermediates, you also want to use more labor. So even with complements, you still get a big boost to labor in, in that case. Um, Finally, on the wages and services, which which you showed go up more, we actually have a version of the model where we have heterogeneous labor, um, so low skilled versus high skilled labor, and it turns out that most of the wage increases in services were at the low skilled uh, part of the distribution. At least, not Federal Reserve uh, employees didn't really get much of a wage boost. Um, so. So for the lower skilled uh, labor in services, we, we, we did see a much stronger wage increase and we can generate this in the model as well uh, when, we, when we put heterogeneous labor in. Um, so finally, um, Joe's question. Uh, yeah, I think your intuition is right. I think when we have the shift on its own, there's some disinflation in services and some inflation in goods and overall the effect is relatively small. I guess we, yeah, we, we could, we should definitely think more about, um, you know, what happens if you, you can't lower the wages and services um, and so on. I guess we, we haven't done that, but that's, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. So thanks. Thank you very much. And then uh, now, now we should turn to uh, Elisa Rubo, who's, uh, who's online. Uh, and, uh, She's going to talk about what drives inflation lessons from disaggregated price data. Um, thank you very much for having me and thank you for letting me present um, online. Um, I'm trying to look for, I'm trying to share my slides. I'm sorry, I cannot um, see the window yet right now. There we go. All right, can you see my slides now? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Um, right now, let's see. Perfect. Okay. Um, all right, so I guess I don't have to convince this audience that um, inflation during the COVID period was a puzzle. Um, and uh, people wondered uh, whether the main determinant of inflation was uh, coming from supply side, uh, such as bottlenecks and shortages, or from the demand stimulus uh, packages that were put in place. Um, in favor um, of the supply side story, uh, people observed that uh, during the COVID episode, there was not just a um, large increase in aggregate inflation, but there was also um, there were also large movements in relative prices, uh, which could uh, somehow suggest that sectors were facing different shocks, and this might have some consequence also for um, aggregate inflation. Um, it is kind of hard to think about though, how to connect relative prices and aggregate inflation um, in um, the kind of textbook um, models that we use to think about monetary policy and inflation, like the New Keynesian framework. Um, essentially, because these textbook models have a representative industry, um, and so um, essentially cross-sectional shocks across industries um, 
cannot be modeled and so it's hard to think about their impact on inflation. Um, so in this paper, uh, what I do is I uh, build on my research agenda and um, that allows for multiple industries and in particular the key innovation of the paper is that I allow for multiple primary factors of production and I will uh, try to convince you that adding this is really key to thinking about uh, supply bottlenecks. And what I show is that in this uh, setting, um, there is an inflation output trade-off uh, coming from um, relative shocks uh, to TFP and demand across sectors. And I will also uh, show you a method to identify which component of aggregate inflation is driven uh, by these cross-sectional uh, shocks across industries and which one is driven by aggregate shocks, so plausibly aggregate demand. Um, so what's the intuition and like what's what's my method in a nutshell? Well, there is, I, I show that uh, just by looking at price data, one can tease apart two drivers of aggregate inflation. One is given by deviations of aggregate output from an appropriate notion of potential output. So that's kind of what we tend to identify uh, with typically demand shocks. Uh, the second component is what I call an inflation output trade-off coming from cross-sectional things. So changes in the desired uh, relative prices across industries. And in particular, the second component, which is absent from standard models, I show that is actually important and quantitatively large. And what's the intuition why uh, cross-sectional shocks could matter for aggregate inflation? Well, essentially think of a, a setting um, in which um, there is some negative TFP shocks or a sudden increase in demand for industries that are downstream, so close to final consumers, or they have more flexible price, or they are um, somewhat inelastically supplied, so supply constraint. So these shocks, I show that actually generate aggregate inflation uh, because they have either a large effect on prices or they are close to consumers, so they have a large effect on consumer prices, um, even though the central bank is not moving demand away from potential. Um, and once I establish that um, this is the case, um, then the next question is, well, can we use data to identify how large these effects are and how important have they been in the COVID uh, setting? What I show is that essentially the relative price movements induced by aggregate demand, say monetary policy versus cross-sectional shocks are never collinear. So basically, just by looking at the behavior of relative prices, which direction they moved, we can understand whether the movement was coming from monetary policy or it was um, coming from uh, cross-sectional shocks. Um, and uh, I applied this methodology to the inflation in the US, um, and I find that in, in 2020, uh, inflation was mostly driven by supply shocks. So the early part of the pandemic, it was entirely bottleneck supply shortages, uh, shifts in preferences, and so on. But after that, the demand component has become more and more important. And I would say it, it accounts for about two thirds of inflation um, starting from 2021 onwards. Uh, so let me skip the literature in the interest of time. I will now briefly go through the environment so that I give you a sense of how the model works, how it's related with the benchmark New Keynesian model. Then um, I will show you why this model is useful to think about what next and I'll then move on to the main theory and quantitative results. So here is just a schematic representation of how I think about the economy. Um, so the economy is going to have a set of primary factors that, that are uh, labor um, and capital assets. Uh, and these primary factors are going to be hired by heterogeneous industries, that's the middle layer, the producers, and industries will sell their products to uh, final users. So that's going to be consumers, investment producers, and the government. So right now I will um, walk you through the way I model all these agents and what are the relevant dimensions of heterogeneity that will be important to generate um, supply-driven inflation. All right, so um, as a quick overview, um, the dimension of heterogeneity that will be important uh, are heterogeneity across primary factors, in particular, um, the, uh, their supply elasticity, that's going to be the key thing, and also the, their wage rigidity. Um, and um, I will allow also for factor-specific uh, supply shocks in the model. Um, then there's going to be heterogeneous industries in that industries use different primary factors. They have different price stickiness and um, they face um, heterogeneous uh, TFP uh, and markup shocks. 
And finally, uh, the final users are going to play a role in the model because they have different consumption models and they face um, taste shocks uh, in their consumption preferences. Like that could be a model um, of um, the shift in preferences from uh, away from services in the beginning of the pandemics and then back to services uh, when lockdown uh, ended. So just to recap, the model will allow for um, things such as the state shocks, but also the fact that maybe some industries had kind of a negative TFP shocks because during lockdowns, people could not um, go to their workplace and they could not uh, be as productively when working remotely. It could account for the inflation, so uh, kind of an increase in desired markups. Uh, it could also account for um, factor supply shock, like people just don't want to go to work because they're afraid of getting infected. Um, great. So with this uh, setup, um, let me just formalize a little bit how I uh, model this setup. Um, I will have these many heterogeneous households. Uh, their preferences are relatively standard. So like in the plain recension model, they will derive household derive utility from consumption and have some visibility from um, labor supply. The key thing is that the household consumption preferences are um, subject to these uh, relative preference shocks. Um, I also have a model of a stylized model of investment and capital utilization. This is essentially because I, to model bottlenecks, it turns out it will be very important to have sector specific capital factors. And this utilization model uh, basically allows me to get to a supply curve for these capital factors that is very simple. It's kind of like the consumption leisure, leisure trade off for uh, consumers. So the quantity of capital that is available has some. Um, inverse elasticity phi with respect to the real wage of the capital, so the rental rate over the cost of utilization. Uh, firms, uh, as I anticipated, I allow for a general input output network, so firms will hire uh, different primary factors in intermediate inputs, uh, and they will also be subject to input demand uh, shifters um, that are kind of like the consumption demand shifters is kind of a minor uh, point. Um, and they will model sticky prices in the usual carbon way at the industry level. Um, aggregation um, is tricky when you have heterogeneous agents models, but I define it in the same way as the national accounts. Um, so um, in particular, I will uh, focus on the connection between uh, inflation, which in the model is gonna be measured as the GDP deflator, um, like aggregate inflation, and uh, a notion of uh, the aggregate uh, real output, aggregate real GDP. Okay, which is going to be the equal to the income weighted share of changes in consumption uh, and investment across final users, um, which is also the equal weighted share of changes in employment of primary factors. Okay, so the, the output gap definition is going to be based on this real GDP and kind of the main inflation measure that I'm going to look at uh, in the model is going to be the GDP deflator uh, in the data I look at uh, consumer prices as well. Uh, great. So to close the model, uh, one needs to specify monetary policy. Uh, to keep things simple, I assume that monetary policy, the monetary policy rules, uh, pins down um, aggregate nominal GDP through a cash in advance constraint. This is basically without loss of generality. Um, as you will see, monetary policy enters the model only through the output gap. So it doesn't really matter whether it's determined by a, a money supply rule or a tailor rule. For, for the inflation decomposition that I show, it doesn't matter. Great, uh, equilibrium is defined in the standard way. So uh, now that I have brought you all this, uh, all this uh, complicated setup, uh, let me instead uh, move uh, to explain why I think uh, having all this richness is important to understand the role of uh, supply bottlenecks. And to do so, I will show you kind of a minimal model uh, of a bottleneck. So what is this minimal model of a bottleneck like? Essentially, it's a model where there is an, an economy with two primary factors uh, of production. One primary factor you can think of as labor um, that is like a elastically, more elastically supplied primary factor. And then there is another primary factor which you can think of as some fixed capital, or for example, the land that uh, ports need uh, to, to receive the shipments or like the trucks that the shipping industry has and so on. So we have these two uh, primary factors that contribute to a final good. Uh, what is uh, a bottleneck uh, in this simple framework? Well, it is essentially a decline in TFP or an increase in relative demand for the inelastically supplied primary factor. 
So that's what's going to cause a bottleneck. And really, this uh, heterogeneity in the supply elasticity is what uh, matters. Um, so what does a bottleneck do uh, in practice? Well, it does two things. First, it's going to lower the potential output of the economy. And second, it's going to create an inflation output trade-off. So here I'm introducing a key distinction that I will uh, maintain throughout the paper. Uh, that is, uh, inflation can come from two things. One is output is deviating from potential. Two is what I call the inflation output trade-off. That is, inflation that will happen even if output is at potential. So how do bottlenecks affect these two aspects? Well, first, why do bottlenecks lower potential output? Essentially because uh, they shift expenditures towards an inelastically supplied uh, factor. So they're kind of shifting expenditures towards a tight part of the economy. So even if aggregate um, productivity is uh, constant, the fact that we are shifting demand towards a tight sector means that the efficient aggregate output is going to decline. Second effect of bottlenecks, they create an inflation output trade-off, uh, at least for consumer prices or the uh, GDP deflator. Why is that the case? Well, here the intuition is a little bit uh, more complicated, but essentially we said these bottlenecks kind of like tend to uh, shift demand and expenditure towards these tight sectors in the economy. So in an efficient economy, what would happen is that the price of these sectors shoots up. And so yes, demand shifts a bit, but like there is some self-correcting mechanism whereby the price increases and so demand kind of shifts back a bit away from these bottleneck sectors. However, if prices are sticky, this price mechanism is not going to work or it's going to work only partially. And so essentially in the sticky price economy, demand for the bottleneck sectors, think the shipment sector in the uh, early phases of the pandemic, uh, remains too high because the prices don't increase quickly enough. Um, and so this beats up the uh, demand and the price of the primary factors that are used in the bottleneck sectors, like the shadow value of trucks or port land um, increases a lot, okay? Um, and it is true that at the same time, um, other primary factors like labor are in inefficiently low demand. But the price of these primary factors is not gonna respond as much because these primary factors are more elastically supplied. So their price does not respond as much to quantity. So essentially on average, factor prices go up due to this inefficiently high demand for the constraint factors, okay? And that's what eventually is going to drive the inflation output trade-off because as average factor prices go up, the good prices also go up and so on, okay? Um, so here is just like the simplest um, possible example that I showed, that I talked about. We have this economy with just like two uh, primary factors. One uh, has um, high, um, elasticity, like a, a, is like elastically supplied. The other is inelastically supplied, and uh, the supply elasticity is captured by the inverse uh, Frisch, one over phi in the equation. Um, and essentially, if we are shifting demand towards the inelastically supplied good, then this covariance um, is going to be negative, which means that um, uh, here I show aggregate output declines. And that's literally we are shifting expenditure to the tight part of the economy, so we get a uh, lower potential output. Um, let's consider the same demand shock, like we're increasing demand for the inelastically supplied uh, sector, uh, and looks at, look at the effect on consumer price inflation. Um, here we see that essentially consumer price inflation is going to depend on the deviation of output from potential, that's what I call Y bar here, but it also depends on the covariance between the inverse fresh and the demand shock. So in particular, if demand uh, goes up for inelastic sectors, so this time it's with a high fresh, this high inverse fresh, this means that we'll have a positive inflation even if output is kept at potential, okay? So um, that's a general issue. It holds in this example, it holds uh, also in a fully general input output network. Um, and that's so essentially the CPI or um, the GDP deflator are going to be subject to these endogenous cost push shocks coming from changes in relative demand or TFP across sectors. Um, interestingly, I show that um, kind of the intuition that cross sectional stuff should can cancel out on average still holds, uh, just not for the CPI. You need to choose your average very carefully. 
and I, I show how you can do this. And essentially, I show that there is always a, a price index um, whose weights do not depend on the shocks that is not subject to these endogenous cost push shocks. Um, and how do you get to this price index? Essentially, you downweight the inelastically supplied goods. Um, so the bottleneck sectors should be downweighted. Inflation there doesn't mean that aggregate demand is changing. It might just come from um, an increase in the relative demand for those sectors. Okay. Um, so this was just an example. Let me show you briefly how you can generalize this argument to uh, the overall economy, construct an inflation decomposition. Um, so first, like uh, it's a key definition is going to be the definition of natural equilibrium. Um, so, uh, because that's what determines, uh, what's the potential output and what's the output gap. So essentially my definition of natural equilibrium is I consider a flex price economy, uh, subject to all the same shock as the actual economy with sticky prices. Um, and I define the natural output and, uh, natural employment of each primary factor and natural relative prices as the output employment and relative prices that would prevail in this flex price economy, subject to the same shock as the actual one. Great, so with this definition, we can uh, look at the main variables that I'm going to relate in the model. Uh, so I will, um, the endogenous variables will be sector level prices and inflation, um, factor level, primary factor level employment gaps, and uh, the aggregate output gap. The exogenous variables will be essentially all the shocks that I throw into the model. And here is the first important result. So I'm going to throw basically all sorts of shocks into this model. And it turns out that the enter the equations only through just one variable. That is what I call the price wedge is chi. So the shocks that I include are sectoral TFP and preference shocks um, and uh, shocks to desire markups. And then I will have shocks to uh, government spending and uh, shocks to fiscal policy through lump sum transfers. On top of this, there will be the monetary shock that determines aggregate demand. Basically, all the shocks except for the money supply are going to enter the model through um, these uh, price wedge objects, which capture the difference between the initial prices, the previous prices that the economy enters with, and the desired relative prices. That's uh, the natural prices, okay? Um, so with this notation, um, I uh, connect uh, the endogenous variables, the prices and employment gap through the uh, Phillips curves. So here we have many sectors. So we don't just have one Phillips curve. We'll have one Phillips curve per each sector, um, connecting um, inflation with the aggregate output gap. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go through exactly what goes uh, into the slope and the cost per shock for each sector, but I want you to recall that we can extend the usual Phillips curve to just derive it sector by sector, and sectors will have different slopes with respect to the output gap. And this is the key thing that these slopes will never be collinear with uh, the effect of cross-sectional shocks uh, on inflation, which is the blue term, okay? So this kappa uh, slope will be always non-collinear with the blue term. And that's how we're gonna be able to separate the two in the data. Once I have the sectoral Phillips curves, I can just like average them out across sectors and combine them into our favorite inflation index. Could be CPI, could be uh, GDP deflator. I am going to focus on two main indexes in the talk. One is consumer prices or the GDP deflator in uh, more general terms. And the other is going to be what I call the divine coincidence index. What is this index? It's the index that is uh, that eliminates the, cost, the endogenous cost per shocks. All right. so. Um, uh, given that I don't have a lot of time left, um, let me just uh, go very quickly um, over this um, over this notation. But essentially, uh, what I want you to take away is that this model, this complicated model with many sectors uh, and primary factors, uh, can be boiled down to some equations that are actually very similar to the baseline Newkensian model. So we're going to have a factor supply equation, which holds, which looks basically like the consumption leisure trade-off. Um, and we're going to have a pricing equation, which is kind of a generalized version of the usual pricing equation. Um, and, um, and then the very, the actual novelty in the model is this new equation, which is the factor demand equation that tell us how the relative uh, demand for uh, primary factors depend on the aggregate output gap and on relative prices. And this is going to be the key part where the, the key equation that models the demand distortions that happen uh, during a bottleneck. So let me skip quickly uh, to 
uh, what the cost push shocks look like uh, in the um, in the equation for the GDP deflator. So this is like conditional on replicating on keeping output at potential. What happens to the GDP deflator based on uh, the sectoral shocks? And they show that essentially inflation in the GDP deflator um, is uh, positive even if um, output is aggregate output is at potential uh, when um, productivity declines or demand increases for sectors that are more downstream or have uh, more flexible prices. That's the first term here, which essentially tells us that um, we can define an appropriate notion of pass-through of cost shocks into prices and sectors that have high pass-through will tend to create more inflation when they uh, get a negative shock. Okay, and these sectors are going to be easy to characterize. They're the downstream and the flex price one. Second term uh, tells us uh, that the same kind of holds uh, for primary factors. So it doesn't just hold for sectors, but if we increase the demand for some type of labor or capital that is used, uh, that has a more flexible price or is used by downstream and flex price sectors, we're going to get the same inflationary effect. But the third term is the interesting one. Uh, it tells us that we're going to have uh, inflation in the uh, GDP deflator whenever um, demand increases of the RTFP decline, that's this term, for um, inelastically supplied uh, primary factors. So they have high inverse fresh pi. Okay. Um, so that's literally what I mean by a bottleneck. We are increasing demand for a tight part of the economy. This is going to generate inflation, even if output is uh, potential. Um, okay, so it turns out that we can create, as I mentioned, a divine coincidence inflation index that doesn't suffer from uh, these endogenous cost push shocks. Um, and what's the weighting scheme for this inflation index? Well, it does three things compared to the CPI. First, it weights sectors according to sales shares uh, instead of consumption shares. That's uh, what I call psi bar here. It means the sales share as opposed to the consumption share that I call uh, beta bar in my notation. Um, second, um, this um, divine coincidence index is going to discount uh, flex price sectors. So delta is the probability of price adjustment at the sector level in my notation. So um, sectors with high delta are going to be discounted. Um, and finally, the divine coincidence index also discounts um, inelastically supplied uh, goods. Okay. Uh, so if you see inflation in, say, the shipment sector, um, and there is a lot more inflation there relative to other sectors, you think, oh, maybe there is an increase in demand for uh, these sectors, and this is a tight sector because it's constrained by the amount of land uh, and, um, and trucks that it has. Okay. So uh, once we have uh, this divine coincidence index, you can use it to basically um, go into the data and disentangle which component of consumer price inflation comes from aggregate demand versus this cross-sectional TFP um, or, uh, or demand shocks. And how do we do it? Well, basically, we can use the divine coincidence index to back out the output gap. And that gives us an aggregate component or kind of sloppily a demand-driven component. And then the residual um, of whatever inflation is not explained by the divine coincidence index uh, is going to be coming from a cost push shock. Okay, so um, this is what I do when I take the model to the data. Uh, so let's skip this one. Um, and I, um, I calibrate the model um, to um, basically um, account for uh, the actual linkages between primary factors and sectors, so expenditure shares of different uh, sectors and more or less elastic primary factors. Uh, and then I combine this data with uh, actual sectoral inflation data to see uh, which sectors experience more inflation and whether um, this, what, what does this tell us about the drivers of inflation. So um, here is, um, I mean, the decomposition that you get depends a bit on the assumptions, but here are a few uh, robustness checks that I did. And I actually found that the message is very consistent across, uh, across different assumptions. So um, here in this graph, the yellow line um, is a kind of demand-driven aggregate component or monetary policy-driven component, if we want. Uh, the red line is the core PC, and the blue line is the CPI. So here in this graph, I'm assuming that capital is fixed at the sector level. And we see that in 2020, basically, we get no demand-driven inflation, if anything, a bit of deflation, and then we get some demand-driven inflation later. If we allow for some capital mobility um, across sectors, 
Um, the answer for 2020 basically doesn't change, but uh, we see that um, the model attributes a lot more um, inflation to demand. And that's kind of intuitive because when you have the, the whole idea of a bottleneck is that you have some inelastic factor that is like stuck in a sector and uh, sectors cannot acquire, like the shipment sector cannot acquire land or trucks from other sectors, right? So if instead we relax this and we say, well, there can be some mobility, uh, then um, the model just thinks that bottlenecks are less important. And so it attributes more inflation to aggregate demand. Another important thing is that we don't have great measures uh, of wages uh, because we have a lot of composition effects during the early phase of the pandemic. So essentially, um, the poorest people were the first to lose their jobs. So the model is kind of, like the data that we have is underestimating the wage drop during the early phase of the pandemic. And I think that these would likely lead us to um, underestimate the demand driven uh, deflation in the early part of the pandemic. So to address this issue, I just basically remove all the weight that the index puts on wages. Uh, and this is what I find. So basically, if we like do our best to correct for this uh, missing um, wage deflation, what we see is that the model now does say that in 2020, the deflation part was uh, partially demand driven and the PC was a good approximation for that. But then the first spike in inflation in 2020 was still uh, entirely supply driven, but then uh, the model will attribute uh, a lot of inflation to aggregate demand even later. Great, so uh, to conclude, um, I provide a new theoretical framework to think about how um, cross-sectional shocks to TFP um, and uh, relative demand uh, can affect inflation. Um, I make a key distinction between inflation driven by output deviating from potential and uh, whatever residual driven by cross-sectional shock. And I found that, um, and I call this residual and inflation output trade off. I find that this inflation output trade off um, increases inflation when uh, TFP declines or demand increases for sectors that are downstream, have flexible prices, or are tight in the sense that they use inelastic factors. Uh, I also show how to disentangle these two components in the data. So, how to use relative price data to understand which component of aggregate inflation was coming from demand and which one was coming from these cross sectional shocks. Um, and um, I find that for the COVID uh, episode, uh, the early phases were mainly driven by these cross sectional supply shocks, so bottlenecks, and then in later phases, aggregate demand uh, was the most important factor. Right, um, happy to take uh, any question and like, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. The discussant is uh... Michel Gassiba from the from Cray. You have ten minutes. Um, thank you for inviting me to discuss this uh, great paper, which is actually a part of also a very interesting and very exciting research agenda. All right, so I guess I don't need to convince people once again that inflation is back in the spotlight, and the question is what drives it. To be more precise, who is to blame? I think is the more precise uh, question. And some people blame the aggregate factors or expansionary policy. Some people blame sectoral shocks, uh, global value chains, uh, bottlenecks. In other words, you know, sources that are very granular and are perhaps beyond the control of you know, aggregate policy. So what this paper does, it tackles the question using a novel uh, framework with, I think, all the necessary ingredients to think about this. You have sticky prices to think about inflation. You have many sectors to think about you know, granular origins of shocks. You have input-output linkages to think about value chains. And crucially, and the last two things are the real innovation of this specific paper, are the multiple primary factors, so many different kinds of labor or capital and heterogeneous supply elasticities to allow for certain factors which are you know in a very inelastic supply and any attempt you know to buy more from them could create uh, bottlenecks all right so that, that's the paper and uh, what it does it develops a very powerful and elegant uh, decomposition in fact for any aggregate inflation index you take your favorite weights for an inflation index and you can show that aggregate inflation uh, whichever way is defined can be decomposed into some aggregate component uh, 
which is ultimately linked to the output gap, and some cross-sectional uh, component, okay? Uh, so that's the decomposition which Elisa derives for any index. And uh, what she finds is that if you apply this decomposition uh, to the COVID crisis in the US, uh, you see that the deflation and inflation in the early days of 2020 were almost entirely driven by cross-sectional factors uh, whereas later in 21, the increase in the CPI was driven by aggregate factors. So that's the result of uh, the decomposition uh, in the paper. So let me briefly uh, walk you through the theoretical contributions of the paper, starting from a very simple example. So I think this equation has been in every single discussion uh, of this conference. So let me do it again. So standard three equation, the Keynesian model, one sector, uh, the new Keynesian Phillips curve, okay? We can uh, rearrange terms and say that aggregate inflation, uh, pi t, minus the sum of endogenous and exogenous markups, eta t, is just the output gap. So it's just rearranging terms, okay? And the right-hand side uh, in this equation is entirely controlled by the central bank. It's the output gap, okay? So this is the decomposition of the sort ELISA considers just applied to the three equation model. So inflation minus aggregate markup is controlled by the central bank. So what ELISA does is she considers the very same decomposition just in a model with many sectors and shows that for the vector of sector specific inflations, so bold pi t minus the vector of sectoral markups is again just the output gaps or scalar minus a vector of sector specific things. And the crucial thing is to unpack those sector specific things. So first you have again, the vector of sectoral inflation expectations and desired markups, that's ETA. And then you have a vector of sectoral price gaps. And those two vectors enter the decomposition with some matrix V in front of them. And absolutely crucially, this matrix has zero rows, which means any aggregate components in those sectoral vectors are completely nullified. So any aggregate component in those sector specific things is not relevant for this decomposition beyond what is already contained in the aggregate output gap, which is why they isolate specifically the sector specific components. Okay which ultimately means relative sectoral shocks matter even if the output gap is fully stabilized. And I think this is a fantastic decomposition because it clarifies some, you know, occasionally sloppy thinking. People are saying that sure, sectoral things matter, something happens in a given sector, this something affects an aggregate object, this aggregate object is not quite fully stabilized, which is why aggregate inflation changes. No, this is not what's happening. Even if that aggregate object is entirely stabilized, sector specific things matter. Even if, if you fully stabilize the aggregate output gap, sector specific things matter. And that's the first message uh, of the paper. Then the obvious issue is that to perform this decomposition in the data, you need a measure of the output gap, which is not uh, re you know, readily observed. But then Elisa shows that it is possible to have a unique set of weights with which you aggregate decomposition to completely eliminate the cross-sectional components, and she calls it the divine coincidence index. So equation one on the previous page, if you apply this unique sector-specific divine coincidence weights, you completely nullify any cross-sectional influence, which means you can track the output gap by tracking the divine coincidence inflation index. Okay, that's the first problem solved. Then a second problem is that you still need to keep track of the ETAs. Uh, those are the sectoral inflation expectations and the sectoral uh, markup shocks. And the way Elisa resolves this problem is by redefining the pre flexible price equilibrium. So she makes all of these endogenous and exogenous markup shocks part of the flexible price equilibrium, which by definition eliminates the ETAs. And ultimately you obtain the aggregation kind of result, saying that any aggregate inflation index is a combination of aggregate forces summarized by the divine coincidence index, which is completely 
immune to cross-sectional shocks and only depends on the aggregate gap, and whatever remains. Okay, and then you can measure the left-hand side as the CPI index or the PCE or uh, deflator. You can measure the divine coincidence index. You have the kappas as some combinations of parameters from the model, and the difference between the two is whatever is driven by cross-sectional factors. This is how you uh, perform the decomposition. And when you apply this decomposition to the U.S. inflation experience, you see that the early uh, stage of the pandemic, the blue line, the aggregate CPI, was kind of poorly tracked by the component respond, you know, of the output gaps, the monetary policy component, which uh, kind of leads to the conclusion that it was mainly driven by cross-sectional factors, whereas the later parts of the COVID crisis were mainly driven by uh, aggregate. Component. So that, that's the paper in a nutshell. Uh, and uh, I would like to make uh, two comments, which perhaps uh, not so much want to change the paper, but help kind of make some of the decompositions more robust and help us think about how these sort of decompositions can be used later in perhaps applied policy practice. So the first point is that, you know, as the paper actually acknowledges, uh, there are a number of uh, channels that can uh, contaminate this very, very clean uh, decomposition and kind of make things uh, you know, confusing, whether or not it's driven by aggregate uh, output gap, monetary policy, or cross-sectional factors. So here's a list of some. Uh, to me, perhaps the most uh, dangerous one is that those uh, chi components, uh, which matter for the decomposition, include lagged sectoral uh, prices as the only endogenous state variable actually in the model. And if monetary policy has any persistent effects, those lagged sectoral prices could pick up persistent effects of, of monetary policy. And, uh, and that's something that uh, I think is most dangerous in this and most obvious. And something uh, which I think we need to answer is whether or not this concern is qual uh, quantitatively important. And I think this could be done uh, in two potential ways, which are doable, I believe. Uh, the first one is a structural approach. So you can simulate kind of an exogenous central bank intervention in the model and trace out the response of the cross-sectional component in the decomposition. To actually see that in, in the model, whether or not uh, kind of lack sectoral prices would uh, respond to uh, monetary innovation under a realistic Taylor rule. I think it's the simplest thing. But then this kind of exercise would be structural, so it's very model dependent. And I think uh, there's a reduced form way of doing this, namely measure the cross-sectional component in the decomposition, and then insert that into a local projection with some empirical measure of the monetary shock on the right-hand side. Then you can see whether the cross-sectional component of aggregate inflation identified in the data actually responds to an identified uh, exogenous intervention to the aggregate component. If this channel is not very strong, that means this concern uh, of kind of contamination and the decomposition is not very large. Uh, and uh, in particular, the second approach could be uh, relatively agnostic in addressing that. Uh, the second comment uh, I would like to make concerns, you know, the specific role played by bottlenecks and primary factors in the decomposition and in the message of the paper uh, more specifically. I mean, the decomposition which Elisa derives would actually hold in a simpler multi-sector Keynesian model, you know, even you know, without primary factors or uh, bottlenecks. I mean, you don't need to go very far uh, to see that. If you go to Elisa's 2023 Econometrica paper, which does not have primary factors uh, or bottlenecks, you have this equation for sectoral Phillips curve. And if you just rearrange the terms here, you would again go back to the decomposition, uh, which Elisa derived here. So given that we can actually not observe either chi's or etis in this decomposition, the only way to distinguish between Elisa's new model and Elisa's old model is to say something about the kappa parameters or to say something about the uh, divine coincidence index. So the, again, the, the, the second difference is that when you construct the divine coincidence with bottlenecks, you need to further discount sectors with inelastic factors. So given that we cannot observe what cross-sectional shocks are actually driving uh, inflation, that's the only way to distinguish whether bottlenecks actually matter or not. And I think here, as my final comment, 
the approach one perhaps should employ is what would I get badly wrong if I ignored the extra layer of complexity? For example, in, imagine that in, I used the wrong divine coincidence index instead of the one derived in this paper, I ignored uh, the bottlenecks. Uh, would this make my decomposition wrong in any major way? If it does make my decomposition wrong in a major way, this means the bottlenecks and primary factors should be part of these models. Or uh, the second question, which is related is, you know, imagine I were to fit a uh, Phillips curve for the divine coincidence index, again, in a simpler model without uh, the primary factors, would it have much larger residuals uh, or not? So again, would I be majorly wrong by ignoring uh, the uh, primary factors, which leads me to my final question, as we'll add more layers of complexity to these models with household heterogeneity, endogenous price rigidity, perhaps, this divine coincidence index, which you need to keep track of to approximate the alpha gap, will also keep changing. So the question is, where do we stop? And how majorly do we get it wrong if we ignore the extra layer of layers of complexity? And it's perhaps a bigger question for this whole uh, literature. But uh, for now, I would like to wrap up by saying that this is a very insightful and powerful paper, and I look forward to the next iterations of uh, this agenda. Questions? Uh, Stephen Tepra from Banque de France. Uh, many thanks, Elisa, for, for the great talk. I was just wondering the following. It seems if I got it right that if I want to close the output gap, I'm going to do it through a different combination of different goods in the sticky price economy than in the flexible price economy. So that possibly I'm going to use different combinations of primary factors in the two cases. So question number one, is it the case that, okay, you already answered question number one. Uh, is it the case that if I close the output gap, I don't close the labor gap? And if so, would it be possible to do the same decomposition as you do focusing on the output gap uh, instead with the labor gap? And in which case would they give different responses to uh, the question you're after? Yeah, so um, great question. Um, so if by labor gap, you mean both labor and all the other utilization gaps, then that's identical to the output gap. Um, if you just look at literally labor, uh, and exclude capital utilization, then the two gaps would be different. Um, and you would get a different, um, I mean, you would get a different Phillips curve. Um, but yeah, I haven't thought how the decomposition would change. But um, so actually one result which I did not present is that you can pick your favorite linear combination of factor specific gaps and construct the divine coincidence index for that. So you could do a divine coincidence decomposition for the labor component um, as well. I'm not sure how quantitatively that would be different. Um, yeah, I hope this answers the question. Uh, yes, and then yeah, you will, you would have uh, also time now to to respond to the discussion. Yeah. Great. So can you still see my slides or uh, do I have to share again? Please share again if you can. Okay. I think I should be able to. Can you see them now? I see. Great. So I think Michelle, so thank you so much, Michelle, for a super thoughtful and super kind discussion. Um, I think Michelle made two main comments or like three main comments. Uh, so I'll try to address uh, each of them in turn. First, um, like potential effects of monetary policy. I mean, we know that in these multi-sector models, monetary policy has persistent effects on relative prices. Um, and so these would go, this would be like a component of the price wedges chi in my notation coming from monetary policy. Uh, so not, in, not exogenous to monetary policy. So how large is that? Um, I actually did something similar to what Michelle was suggesting, which is like this structural matter that Michelle was suggesting. So basically I um, compute impulse responses for the model um, and based on those, I back out what were the shocks um, that were driving the actual inflation data. So what are, what's the, in every time, at every point in time, what's the 
monetary shocks and what's the cross-sectional shocks, the cross-sectional component of inflation. Um, and based on that, I redo my decomposition kind of like based on a dynamic um, setting, which accounts also for uh, the effect of monetary policy on cross-sectional inflation expectations. Um, and this is what I find. Oh, oh. okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize that the, um, the, um, the figure was wrong size. Anyway, I find that whatever uh, extra component you get is basically super small. So maybe you can see this figure. Uh, let me share the figure directly. I think I'm the goofiest presenter in the whole crowd. Okay, anyway. So it, in the, um, like in the yellow line, that's the baseline. Um, in the black line, that's just um, literally the effect on inflation of the current uh, monetary shock period by period, and the two are very similar. So that really suggests that um, the dynamic component is not really confounding the decomposition between aggregate and cross-sectional. Um, I just want to reiterate that um, I like to call the two components that I identify an aggregate component and a cross-sectional component, because actually neither of the two is entirely driven or entirely non-driven by monetary policy. Both components have some elements that are endogenous and some elements that are exogenous to monetary policy. This graph that I'm showing you kind of makes the case that um, the endogenous component uh, of the cross-sectional piece is very small. Um, how about the aggregate piece? It could be driven by monetary policy. It could be driven by aggregate greedflation. Those I cannot tell apart. Um, and to the second point that Michelle was making, so that was about how important is the bottleneck aspect compared to what was already there in my job market paper. That's a great question. I don't have a figure to show. The two decompositions that I get are different. Uh, if I use the model in my job market paper with only one polymeric factor versus the one with multiple factors and bottlenecks, they are not massively different. Why? Well, there has been some correlation between capital intensity and inflation. So that explains why accounting for the like lower elasticity of supply of capital gives us a different decomposition in the early phase of COVID. Why are the two decompositions not hugely different? Because essentially this divine coincidence index always end up assigning a high weight to the wage component because it's very upstream and very sticky. And so ultimately a lot of the decomposition is going to be driven by how much wages have moved. Um, and to the question, like, where should we stop? I do think, I mean, I wrote this new paper because I really wanted to get to a model of bottlenecks. And I realized that the, having these multiple primary factors um, is essential. And you could think of multiple primary factors also as kind of decreasing returns. Uh, that's isomorphic. Like, if you have a sector with decreasing returns, you can always think of there being a sector specific fixed factor. So conceptually, the two are similar. So I think if you want to model a tight sector, a bottleneck, you really, you really need these multiple primary factors. So I guess the ingredients I put in the model kind of reflect what I thought was a salient feature of the word that I wanted to capture. Um, but I don't see, like, actually, I have some results that is fairly general which is that ultimately what matters in creating these cross-sectional effects are two things, which is the supply elasticities and the degree of network adjusted wage rigidity. So all the other kinds of heterogeneity that you can throw in the model are actually going to be second order. So that's kind of a, a sharper answer. Like you can add more heterogeneity, but um, at least in the setup that I am considering, it's not going to have a first order effect. Great. Uh, thank you very much. So, yeah, let's just give a hand, I think. Thanks a lot. So, so this concludes the uh, first day of the, of the conference. Uh, so thanks a lot for, for attending.
Um, the tomorrow we will start at ten thirty, and uh, the uh, those who, who are invited uh, to the dinner we can meet downstairs at uh, at six forty five to to walk over to the to the restaurant uh, together, or or you can go to directly to Steigenberg. Uh, we will start and be there at uh, seven.